Hello, and welcome back to On the Horn with Steve-O. I am your host, Steve-O, and today I'm joined by filmmaker, actor, and author, Catherine Sai. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve-O, for having me on the show. Pleasure to be here. So, I first saw you in the NGA Film Festival that was at Rutgers. You had your film Flesh there, and you actually came up and did a, a Q&A afterwards, uh, which I thought was really cool. After that, we decided that we wanted to get in touch with you and kind of see if you were interested in coming onto the show. And it took us like five months, <laughs> however long it's been. I don't know if it's been quite that long, but it took us way too long. Really glad to have you on here now, though. Anything you want to throw out there about film or the Film Fest before we get started? Uh, I'm going to go into kind of how you got into acting yeah, well, and directing. Uh, first, I'd like to say I'm really, really like glad that you're not who I, I was hoping you wouldn't be. <laughs> And what I mean by that is this. I think I remember who you're talking about. You, you know who I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guy that was sitting in the front uh-huh. with his swimming trunks on. Yep. And he was throwing all these questions at me that just, dude, really? That, that's what you got from this? But <laughs> basically, he made me improvise a sequel to the movie right there on the spot. Because he wanted to, he, I guess he wanted more. I guess that's a testament to it's a good film. Cool. But yeah, he had me on the spot creating a sequel and giving it to him it was, for, his, for his personal pleasure. It was pretty intense and, like, really strange, but I thought you did a really good job answering his ridiculous questions. Yeah, I tried my best, and uh, I tried to give him what he wanted and seemed satisfied. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, so I was hoping that that wasn't you. I was hoping I wasn't walking into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have been a whole other no, experience tonight. Definitely not me. We were, we were over on the side laughing at that guy. <laughs> Cool. Yes, I'm glad. I'm glad you're relieved that I'm not him because I'm relieved I'm not him. <laughs> Good. Welcome to On the Horn. I'm Steve O, your host, and on this show, I will be interviewing some of my favorite nerds about their own particular flavor of nerdiness and the lengths that they go to to celebrate it. All right, well, let's get into a little bit about how you got into acting and directing. We were talking a little bit before the show. You said you got started in college. Why don't you take us through that? Yes, yeah, started in college. Uh, I took a theater class at Rutgers. I was at Rutgers Newark for a little bit. And one class, one semester, I thought it was awesome. And once the semester was over, I started uh, the following year. This is going into my sophomore year. And I'm taking biology class, right? Mm-hmm. And my mom's in there just dissecting this fetal pig with my lab partner and everything is just dandy and life is just going according to the plan at this point, <laughs> you know? I had no idea what I wanted to be yet. I haven't declared any major, so I'm just, you know, wasting a lot right. of money. <laughs> Sounds like me in college. <laughs> <laughs> Where is this train going? But anyway, so, uh, so I'm sitting there cutting this pig open. I thought it was the most disgusting thing I'd ever done at this point. I do not want to be a doctor. I cannot stand being in a hospital. I hate the whole experience of it. Yeah. Right? And so I'm like, all right, at this point, I think I have an epiphany. And I said to myself, okay, what am I doing right now? Where is this taking me? Why am I doing this? Why am I cutting open this pig? For what? What am I going to get out of this (laughs) I'm going to use as an essential skill in my life? And so literally at that moment, it just hit me that I don't want to be here. I don't need to be here. And I probably shouldn't be here. I should do something more in line with where my passion is. And that class I took really had a big impact on me. And so... The next day, I came and drove all the way up to Newark, where I was going to school near Rutgers, and I went to the administration's office, and I withdrew from college. Of course, the parents weren't crazy Yeah, 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 <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. But, I mean, when you know, you just know, man, you just hey, have to go for it. Hey, I, I, I actually applaud knowing what you want to do and just doing it. That's, that's pretty impressive. Well, I figured, um... You know, if nothing else, it's a great story. <laughs> yeah, that's really... <laughs> it is a cool story, and, but... And there... Certainly is something else, at least so far. You know, you, it seems like you're doing pretty well. So far, so good. Uh, how long have you been uh, acting and directing now at this point? Um, well, I haven't really directed yet. I didn't direct this. Oh, I you didn't thought, direct no, Flesh? Oh, I, I thought wanted you did. to, but um, it became too much. Okay. Because I was basically uh, pulling every other string and gotcha. every other hat. Gotcha. And so directing requires your f- full capacity yeah, to yeah. process everything. A laser focus. Exactly. So, um... Luckily, Tony, who was DP, who was helping me along, uh-huh. he is also a very skillful director, and he loved the piece, and he wanted to 
directed and he had some cool ideas that he brought to the table and awesome. that impressed me so I felt comfortable giving it to him and letting him do it so yeah I didn't direct it but eventually that's uh inevitable I feel like with what I do Did, you wrote it right yes I, okay I wrote all right it. that's I guess Definitely. that's where I that's where I got the wires crossed there yeah, yeah this is, uh, sorry about that <laughs> this, uh, from uh craziness that goes on here, trying to figure out and ask myself questions about this reality we've all found ourselves in oh yeah believe me i i've been i've been there I, i've been trying to trying to write here and there different things for a long time and that's always getting into these philosophical questions is yeah, always like right right where i go you can't help it i mean it's, absolutely yeah, it's just i need answers damn it yeah yeah exactly <laughs> Exactly, and and that's the best way to figure stuff out. At yeah. least, at least your own stuff, you know. Play with it and uh, get lost in it, and try to find your way out of it, and write yourself in and out of situations, and you end up finding your own answers to things, and it's all it's relative to you. Yeah, for sure. What what kind of what kind of things do you think are your uh, are your strengths? It's as far as acting or even writing. Uh, I love acting. I think it's it's great, but it's. It's so rare that you see it done the way I feel like it should be done. Mm-hmm. I always feel like we have sacrificed the craft of it for the cult of personality that drives it. And so the actual human behavior and understanding that I want to get from what's really going on, is, is I'm not getting it. It's yeah. a sacrifice for contrived, preset behaviors that convey certain ideas so you're really into the kind of the naturalistic feel of of acting that type of thing you want you want things to feel like they feel in real life when when you get an actor or or maybe even greater than real life you know it's it's all about the art of acting for you um or maybe not the reality of it yeah i mean i want to see the moments that come out unconsciously Mm these moments that you have when you're just you're talking to someone and next thing you know you're just twirling your hair just you don't know what why you're doing that or you're playing with this cup on the table you don't know why you're doing that and you it's just it's all happening so many things happen in a person's behavior because there's so much going on there's never a moment that a thousand things aren't happening in someone's behavior and i feel like that's just lost when it comes to yeah, all that stuff that's beneath the surface. Yeah, and, and I guess it's, I, I know why, but I would love to see it happen organically. But the reason is it's it's distracting on film. Mm. It, it gets very distracting. There's so many um, things you can or can't do on film right, right. just because it distracts the viewers. I mean, what, what I meant before by certain things convey a certain meaning is basically that. You have to, as a viewer, you're trained to take your cues mm. from the actors. Absolutely, yeah. They look this way, it means that. They look, look to the left, shift the eyes, oh no, he's up to something. You you have, all these cues have been programmed in us already. Mm. And so you kind of have to give the viewer what they know. Otherwise, you confuse them. So I guess that's the only thing that bothers me a little bit. I'd love for that to be shaken up and just to see someone really, truly going through and experiencing a moment. I mean, when it happens as an actor, on the other side of things, it's it's phenomenal. It's that yeah. moment where you're really beside yourself and you're just going with it and you snap out and you come back after the scene's over. It's like, oh, wow, what? that was awesome. I don't remember a thing, but it was a great experience going through it, you know? And I guess that's just what ideally I'd love to see on film and what I aspire toward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, I guess that, like, shaking up the status quo is always something I look for in, in film or, or writing or, or what, you know, any kind of art. I think that's uh, a really good thing to strive for, for sure. So are there any specific themes that you tend to go back to or that you tend to like, gravitate towards in your acting, your writing? Those uh, things? More so writing. Um, well, act, with acting, you don't really have right. much control in the material unless you're writing the material. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I guess I, I love writing themes that inspire questions Mm. themes that we don't necessarily have answers to themes that awaken the imagination to go places kind of like with uh flesh it's so layered and there's so many things packed in i mean it's it kind of speaks on everything going on inside someone when you see their work and there's so many questions that i wanted to get in this i mean it's a short piece but at the same time it's a lot to digest 
Yeah. So um, I feel like writing gives you a lot more control to create whatever you want to create and to explore whatever you want to explore personally and tie it together in a very well-told story. And that's the ultimate goal. I mean, I feel like some people just get indulgent a lot. Yeah. And so and they, they tend to lose the actual skill of it. Whereas you are telling a story and it's not necessarily about you. It's about the arc of this thing. Where is it going? And how is it going where it's going? That's the most important part. You know, how is it going where it's eventually going to go? Right. So, yeah, it's not necessarily getting indulgent in your own psyche, but just being able to pull out these elements from your psyche and putting them into a well-crafted story. Yeah. Being able to talk about them without glossing over them or like without puffing them up too much yeah. you know, kind of talking about the raw emotion or the raw philosophy or thoughts there right absolutely and what, what i hate a lot i see it happen a lot is that i hate getting the same interpretation over and over and over again <laughs> i mean reboots and yes all of us in this are... room are never going to see something the same way or tell something the same way or experience anything the same way and so we all have our own ideas. Mm. And I hate the sacrifice of your own ideas, the originality that, that gets sacrificed for banality. Yeah. You know, I'm not, it's boring. I, I can't, I enjoy original, well-crafted imagination. <laughs> I'm right there with you, man. I, I, I really lament the just amount of reboots and remakes there are right now I, I really wish there was more original screenplays out there I wish there were more original stories out there even if they're not great just something original is really what I want to see you know something new but that's probably a good transition to go into talking about Flesh alright uh, the film that Ian and I watched at the NJ Film Fest and the one that you was that the premiere of it? Was that the first time you showed it? That or? was actually the premiere of it. Yeah, first nice. time it was screened. And you said it's kind of it's got a couple more uh, coming up. I, we can talk about that at the end. But uh, you said there, you're screening a couple more times. Have you screened it between now uh, and then? No, I haven't. All right, uh, all right, perfect. So you have your. Uh, yeah. you, you can you can tell everybody that uh, they haven't missed anything yet. Not a thing yet. <laughs> Segwaying into the next. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. I guess give us. Can you give us a little bit of a rundown of of some of the themes and some of the ideas in Flesh and what it, kind of what it's about. You know, a little synopsis, I guess. Yeah, sure. Flesh started with the idea of survival, right? I mean, what does survival mean? You have two complete different polar opposite sides of survival. You have death and you have procreation, right? Mm -hmm. Flesh deals with the fight for your life, the actual tangible survival mm -hmm. aspect uh, 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 of the film. And you also have the procreation, which is that new life, which is also generates right. uh, the survival mechanism. But you have these two opposite ends of survival, which is procreation and actually trying to pr preserve yourself, preservation. And that's really where the film came from mm. originally i just had um this idea of someone being strangled to death <laughs> i'm really a nice sweet <laughs> person. I don't know where all these dark hey we've all had that from. we've all had that uh, thought before yeah and um <laughs> that mixed or intercut with someone being lightly choked in a foreplay mm. you know a little um s and m and just that representing that aspect of procreation, you know? So I, I, I wanted to give you the contrast of these two aspects of the same thing. Yeah. And I, I originally wanted to start the film that way, cutting back and forth with close, tight shots of someone being strangled versus someone being lightly choked in bed mm -hmm. to, to a point of an orgasm, also leading to a point of death. Right. And that's what, that's, what I, that's what I originally wanted to start with, but... Throughout the editing process, I realized, you know, it might be better just to tell the story differently. That was <laughs> yeah. the first edit of the story. But um, that's one of the major themes that I deal with in, in Flesh. A second is, um, this is the philosophical idea of one animating source that gives life, or one source that 
animates every living life experience. That one idea, whatever it is, I mean, it's different to, to every person, to every culture, to every religion, but ultimately it all goes back to this common through line that we're all referencing or trying to describe or relate to in each of our own ways, you know? Right. Call it what you want, you know, you call it God, call it Hashem, call it whatever you want to call it. So many different names that each culture has for this one idea that is responsible for as the animating source of everything. And so I wanted to take that one idea and artistically depict that in my film, that concept of this one idea behind every life source, this one animating source behind everything. And so I wanted to depict that. And so how I did that was with one male actor mm -hmm. and one female actor. And these characters, these two actors play every other role. They're responsible for giving life to every single role that you see within the film. Yeah. That's uh, one of the lines that eventually comes back and gets repeated and echoes toward the end of the film is that we're all just the same from person to person going through different life experiences. Yeah, I had that. I actually had that as I was going to bring it up if you didn't. Know, I was yeah, say, yeah, yeah. That's, um, that's one of my favorite lines. I mean, that is my favorite line in the piece and, and that ultimately is the crux of the film. Yeah. Is that that line and when it comes in it's just at a great moment where everything is being revealed and you see this world that they live in now. You see all these characters outside but you're seeing the same people but they're all in different roles having different experiences so it just kind of artistically parallels that idea of one animating source behind every living life experience that, no matter Absolutely, how different yeah. it is yeah yeah i i, I that was uh, one of the stronger things that like hit me and uh, that i remembered about the film was after i watched it i was like yeah this this idea of kind of everybody has the same struggles kind of everybody comes from the same source and despite the fact that we're all different people because the actors or the characters that is are very different even though the actors are the same you right. like you still have that same I guess, starting point as an act like you were you were you know you were the male actor and so at from that starting point you branch off into every single different uh, character that that's shown in this film which you know it, are between I forget what their name Tim and Tim Jack and Jack other than them it's just some people on the street or whatever but there's still that idea that you get that, you know, everyone's kind of the same person in some way, even though they're all, even though they all have their own differences, their own personalities, their own, you know, types of things that are going on. We still come from that same, like you said, that same source, you know, right. which is, which is really interesting to me. Uh, there's a quote actually from my book that sums that up pretty nicely. It's that we might be in different positions, but we're all in the same situation. And that's ultimately what flesh depicts. I mean, yeah, we're in different positions. I mean, but we all are in the same situation. I mean, we, we have the same aspirations in life. It comes out differently. It's expressed differently from you to me or the next person. But ultimately, I mean, what is it that we're all after? A sense of comfort, a sense of love, a sense of peace, a peace of mind where we can get it. I mean, we have aspirations and goals. I mean, who doesn't have these things? We all have yeah. the same basic needs. You know, we, and we're all in the same situation of trying to attain these things for ourselves and for our families or extended friends or whatever the case might be. But sure, we might be in different positions and we go about trying to get it and acquire these things in different ways. But ultimately, we're all in the same situation. Sometimes. Comes down, yeah, we're all stuck on this ball. And, uh, I was just going there too, sitting on this rock yep. in the middle of nowhere. Flying through space, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. All right. Well, I also wanted to, unless unless you have any other uh, themes that you want to touch on, I also wanted to talk about something you already talked about in the first section. Sure. Which was, uh, or something you touched on a little bit, but I kind of want to, I guess, delve a little bit deeper. You, I think in this film you use sex as a weapon. And it's not, it's not just like one character doing it. This is like, sex is kind of this weapon is either weaponized against or for or being used by like every character in the, in the film. And I just want to kind of get into that a little bit. Like, what's the what was the impetus for for that? Like making that part of the part of the story. 
Well, there is another question that's posed by uh, Belle, mm. the lead female actress, and she says, so who are the real victims of the flesh? And that's ultimately where that use of sex comes from. Who is the victim of the flesh? On the surface, it seems like it's women. I mean, they are, quote-unquote, the weaker of the sexes, quote-unquote. Right. <laughs> Make sure we put quotes on that. Quote-unquote there. But, um, yeah, well, I mean, sure, you, you, can't, av- you can't avoid that. Physically, men are built differently than women. I mean, of course, men are the dominant of the two sexes. But uh, that's besides the point. That's a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. We don't want to get into that one. Yeah, we don't want to go there. <laughs> but you have this idea of men always imposing their will on mm-hmm. women. You know, and um, throughout many cultures, you see women have to cover up a lot. Just, God forbid, they entice some man or turn some man on by a flash of an ankle. Well, the case maybe is that right. I'm just making a joke here. But yeah, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I completely agree. Though. Right, but um, men have been consistently imposing their will on women, mm-hmm. and on a sadder note, I mean, you you see that you see it in domestic violence a lot. Yeah, which you also talk. Yes, you know, that's a huge which topic. Is also, in like a big part. And actually, probably so. The whole first, I guess, five minutes or so of this are incredibly uncomfortable. Definitely is. Because, and I, I like, rightfully, I mean, rightfully so, as they should be, because it's, it's this domestic violence situation, and there's, you know, it, it's, it's a rape scene. It's, it's a rape scene. And, and it's a pretty, you know, it's, it's rough. these, it's, it's, you know, these people that are together, but the guy gets really pissed off. And then, who was that? That, that was Jack, right? Jack, right. Jack gets really pissed off at Belle. And he rapes her in the middle of the kitchen, and then she. So that's sex being used as a weapon against her. Absolutely. And then she turns around and uses it, uses sex as a weapon to kill yeah, him. Ultimately, get him back. Yeah. Revenge. Which yeah. I thought was a really interesting turning of the tables on that. Yeah, Jack's a pretty twisted guy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. He's that. He's a bit of an extreme. I mean, everyone is kind of an extreme mm-hmm. in this, but he's the, the extreme of that jealous. Right male like alpha male exactly yeah. like just to, to the extreme that, that's who he represents yeah exactly well and then Tim is the complete opposite end of the spectrum he's like exactly, the white yeah. knight like but who is kind of ineffectual right As and his character is really interesting too is just like a perfect perfect opposite to uh, to Jack's character you know and I like that you got both of them in there as just these two super extremes I thought that was really interesting Sorry, I just took over your. Oh no, it's all, it's all good. Let it go wherever it'll go. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I I like that part of the film, and I wanted to mention also. Well, I guess you talk about a bunch of these philosophical points, right? Mm-hmm. So identity, survival. I just mentioned sex as a weapon, that type of thing. Uh, this similar place that everyone comes from. What do you want people to come away from the film with thinking about? Ultimately. As twisted as this might seem, given the film itself, a sense of understanding of unity. Totally contradiction of <laughs> the film. Total contradiction, completely. Uh, I understand that. But I really rested this entire film on the repetition of Tim's lines that mm. we're all the same from person to person, just going through different life experiences. Yeah. And that, to me, is what I really want to be taken away from this film. I mean... Granted, you see all the different shades of life between our relationships with each other and how we go about manipulating each other and getting what we want or controlling or possessing or trying to dominate each other. You see all that. But ultimately, behind all that, I mean, all that stuff is was just part of a, a, a good story. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you want to give the audience as much as you can and give them everything, especially in a short film. It's like, all right, well, all right, I, I have a story, but... Now I want to give you sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> right. You know, on top of, of it all. Yeah. I want to Im- entertain the hell out of you in these 15 minutes. You got to give the people what they want. You got to give them what they want. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's what they always want. Yeah. yeah. But ultimately, that is what I would love to get taken away from this. Just that sense of unity. Yeah. From person to person. That's, uh, I like, I like that thought. But I'm also like looking at the, the end of the movie and... <sighs> There are no men. There are no men left, and there are only women left. I'm wondering, like, 
I, I was wondering if you were trying to say anything with that. Like, this is, this, like, you know, they don't, you know, women don't necessarily need men to get get by or get along. I, I thought that was probably, I mean, I thought that might have been something that you were thinking of. Um, interesting. Interesting. But um, I think, from my point of view, that plays itself more to the victim role, right? It's who are the real victims of the flesh. Right. Who are the two victims laying on the floor <laughs> at the end of this? <laughs> True. <laughs> the True. Two, two, two men. Yeah. I mean, men ultimately are the victims of the flesh. Although it seems on the surface, I mean, we talked about this earlier, but I guess we didn't really finish it off or trail it off, but it seems like women are the victims of the flesh, you know? They're mm-hmm. subject to all of men's, men's advances mm-hmm. and they're, they're liable to, I don't know, uh, be raped as you saw in right. this film, which is a very, very heavy and sensitive subject, but I tried, I tried to handle this classically as I, tastefully as I could, but women are subject to so much more than men are on the surface. Mm-hmm. But in reality, why are they subject to so much more? Because they are the desire that men cannot control themselves around. We have to cover you up because I can't control myself around you. You know? I... I, I come after you because I want you so bad I can't control that urge and so I have to take it so in reality where does the power lie in yeah. women they have us doing stupid crazy things left I, and right <laughs> I completely agree I completely agree with you for the most part that I think that well I don't know I guess I would say that can go both ways too, it definitely you know? can of course it definitely can but, it's just off of this purpose it's yeah, just yeah, yeah. this one I, way you know and Belle is a very very intelligent woman absolutely. and she knows what she's doing and how to manipulate all these characters mm-hmm. in the way that she did. And she uses everything that they try to bring uh, to her against them, especially in the dialogue with Tim. And that's where this whole, well, who are the real victims of the flesh dialogue is, is flushed out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you come to find out, no, it's, yeah, women are subject to men's advances and might be the physically weaker of the sexes, but in reality, they have everything that we run around scratching our heads and, and, and flexing our egos for. Right. You know? Yeah. I mean, it always has been. You can look back to the oldest stories the same way, you know? <laughs> That's the oldest profession in the world, as they say. Yeah. You but, go uh, back, there's a, there's a war in, uh, <laughs> in Rome over a uh, Yeah, over right, Rome, exactly. You know? No one's fighting over men. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. That, that's the end of it. No one's fighting over men. Wars are not. <laughs> not Wars are not fought for men. men. Exactly. Um, I just wanted to ask what what were the differences with playing these two guys? So you were you acted as both characters, and disregarding like the actions of both of them, what what do you think you identified more with? Uh, like which uh, personality type do you think you identified more with? I am not Jack at all. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, nowhere near Jack. Uh, Jack, dis- I, I despise Jack. But yeah. He's just a good for a story. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I, I, I feel kind of the same way that, that alpha pushing yourself on people is... I don't like people. <laughs> I don't it's like people like that. It's I'm, glad, I'm glad you say that. <laughs> it, it's, it's very weak. Yeah. Um, not necessarily Tim either. Right. But more toward... Same side of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, yeah, I guess, I guess that is they are very, very extreme, both of them. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I can see that. With the brain of Bell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get pushed too far, and you just okay. Someone has to die. Yeah. Time, time to go. <laughs> and it's gonna be more than one of you. <laughs> so I wanted to mention your actress, uh, Julia Morrison. Yes, yes, Julia. She's. Right, the actress. She was she was great in the film, and I think she really shines in that in the scene that you keep referencing, where she's talking about the weakness of the flesh, who is who is actually the weaker, you know? Right. In terms of that, how did how did she become a part of the film, and how did you, I guess, how did you get her in there? Like, how did you, you get her into the film? Julia came to audition, and um, it's crazy. Like this little short film, I had five hundred girls wow. submit for this role through um, Actors Access. And that's insane. That's Dude, a lot. That is a <laughs> lot. No, no lie. So I, have it up. Like, I, I look back at it once in a while just like in just amazement at all <laughs> these people just vying for this one little bitty part. Yeah. And it, I mean, it kind of speaks to the profession and just how hard it really is, you know? Yeah. And when you start 
producing your own work or when you get on the other side of things and you start seeing this part of the process, it's like, wow, all these people for this <laughs> one little part in this 15 minute short film. But um, yeah, she was one of the people who submitted. It's funny because I saw her headshot and I said, yeah, that's her. That's her. Yeah. I, I knew it was. Yeah. yeah. You can just tell. You, you, you see what you want. I didn't know what I want when I wrote it. I wanted something different. I was thinking maybe a redhead, mm-hmm. you know, just something a bit offbeat. I saw her head shot. It kind of had a little shade of of red in there, but it, not really. But she just had this presence about her that came through. And I loved her short hair. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I called her in along with, uh, like, 12 others. I narrowed it down to 12. Okay. And uh, they all came by. And again, as soon as she walked in, I knew this yeah, was her. You were like, like, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's a given. It's right. <laughs> yeah. She came in, tossed her bag down, <laughs> had a story about this, just going. Yeah. I'm just sitting there like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, that, this happened. Just flipping out, I think she lost a shirt somewhere. Uh, what? Yeah, she lost a shirt. <laughs> she just comes in, just like, just flipping out about the shirt. And I was like, all right, this is cool. So, you know, you want to audition? Yeah, we can get started now. She's like, and scene. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Done. But uh, yeah, she, she was awesome. She came in and she uh, read for the part and she she has this really um, quiet, uncomfortable edge to her. Mm. Yeah, that comes through for yeah, sure. Yeah, it comes through, especially yeah. in that scene. Yeah. That, that, was, yeah. Um, that was great. That was a great scene. Yeah, and she brought that to the audition as well. I mean, everyone was in there trying to be Belle and uh-huh. put on this act and she just simply sat there and just I'm like oh my god I'm scared of you <laughs> just, you're just a horror Belle. like if this if, you, if this is who you really are because if it is I'm, I'm out of here <laughs> <I gotta go. laughs> this woman is deranged and yeah. it's like logically messed up in many ways but uh yeah she wore it <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great though I like I, it's, it's cool like you know you hear stories from people that say that they just knew exactly who it was, but it seems like it happens a good amount. Like, you see the person that, in your mind, you wrote a part for, or, like, you, it's, the director sees a person that, in their mind, they, like, have for the part, and then that's it. Like, boom, it's cast, done. It just seems like that's... That must be the best. It's like, ah, oh, I don't have to worry about this. I know exactly what's going on. It's good to go. We can worry about other stuff. Yeah, it really is. And uh, I think the, the the fear behind that is like you, you hope that this person is it. Yeah. When you see it, you just know. Yeah. You just hope like, okay, <laughs> just I hope she, she, she can just speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she can speak. Like just be normal yeah. and just be what I'm hoping for, you know? <laughs> and you're sitting there just hoping that this person could just at least just speak. Yeah. Well, it worked out for you. <laughs> she definitely could speak. Yeah, yeah, she can speak. Anything, anything else you want to talk about uh, as far as the film? Any other stories or anything? Uh, yes, there's one uh, topic we did not cover with the film. Belle ends up with... Oh, with Charlie. With Charlie. <laughs> Charlie is another woman. Yeah. And um, she's, I guess, um, a bit more on the masculine side. Right. Belle represents um, that category of women who give up on men. Right. As well. Who... who just can't do it anymore and started exploring different mm-hmm. things and so she ends up with herself essentially yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as Charlie she ends up with this character Charlie at the end yeah, who yeah. is a bit of a menacing character herself definitely I was, I was scared of her yeah she came she in and like, <laughs> that's she's pretty stabs badass. the hell out of uh, <laughs> what's she doing with that knife out of Tim <laughs> give, give us a nice glare for the camera yeah <laughs> <laughs> Funny. I, liked her, I liked her nose ring too. That's good. Funny story, right? All right. I don't know if I should. Well, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess this is the magic of movie making, right? You, you, you never know exactly what the hell you're really watching. Yeah. It just looks good. <laughs> so that scene you saw, uh, Charlie coming in with the knife when she walks mm. in, and that was actually uh, Tony, the director. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> So did you know that was going to happen when you walked in, uh, like, onto that set that day? Um, no. To- Tony came up with that? Or was that was Tony's hand? That was Tony's hand. Oh, oh no, 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 that was written. I thought, I thought you meant you didn't no, write no, no, it. No, no, Tony no, was, like, no, no, surprised no. you. Like, she just came idea. at you with a knife one day. You're like, what the hell's going uh, on? No, 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 no. It was written. But, um... Okay. 
we wanted to keep Bell in the shot as oh. well because when when you shoot these kind of films, you have yeah. to yeah. switch actors out and whatnot and um, have a stand in. But I wanted to keep Bell in that scene because her being there and just that contrast is so powerful, and you mm. see that this the emptiness in her that she doesn't really care for any yeah, of these people. Yeah. I think she kind of felt bad about Tim, but she knew it was necessary. But yeah, so yeah, that was Tony that stepped in there. Yeah. <laughs> Flash that thing. Nice. Played played Charlie for a minute. <laughs> yeah, Tony was Charlie. <laughs> Best supporting actor. Charlie's or er, Tony's bad. <laughs> Julius slash Tony. <laughs> yeah. Uh that's cool. That's cool. So everybody that listens gets a little behind the scenes uh, action on this on uh, Flesh. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I guess I'm. Um, I also got to thank, like, uh, Alex. Alex was a cool uh, guy that came through. Alex uh, Oheb, he was, um, he did the sound for us. Okay. He just came to hang out. Next thing you know, he's holding a boom mic all day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm like, well, man, you are a trooper, Alex, dude. Good luck. Uh, that's cool. I've definitely done similar thing. When I was in school, I, I had a couple of buddies that were into filmmaking, and I was like, came to see what the set was like and I ended up holding a boom mic for, you know, it's not an easy. hour and a half. No. It is not easy. It's not completely it's underrated <laughs> how, how heavy that thing is. Yeah, especially after like 15 minutes of holding it above your head or whatever. You and know? on top of that, like they're yelling at you, it's like, you're in the shot! Dude, you're in the shot! <laughs> that boom mic, come on, man. You're messing it up. I'm just volunteering, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just trying to help. <laughs> All right, well, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about your book as well, so we'll go off of flesh for a minute. It's called the the Braille Stone. The Braille Stone, yeah. And Braille spelled B R A Y L. Space or dot Y L. Dot Y L. Dot yeah, Y L. Um, part of the acronym of it. So what what is that? What does that mean? Kind of what are, what are we gonna what are we gonna find out in this book? What are we, what are we gonna get from the book? Well, are you familiar with alchemy? I don't know the science of it. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, well, that's I know, what, I know gonna, what alchemy that's is. That's what you're yeah. going to get in this book. The Braille Stone, an elixir of dreams, the subtitle of the book. Braille is a modern recreation of alchemy, tailored specifically for the contemporary seeker of dreams. Alchemy is, I guess, more popularized as the mad scientist's desperate drive to transmute base metals into their purest form of gold. Mm. It's always been seen as this tangible, physical, magical process of changing things into the purest form, primarily base metal into gold. Yeah. But in reality, alchemy is actually the practice of transforming yourself, of changing yourself from your base, distracting, egoistic characteristics to a more elevated, heightened awareness, the pure golden awareness side of yourself, quote-unquote. So that's alchemy. Alchemy is, I guess, the oldest form of transformation, of changing towards betterment. It's the the root behind philosophical thought in a way. It's it's the seeds of religion. If you want to go back to that, it's that process of aligning man with the divine ultimately, and that is always the highest attainment is getting closer to the divine aspect of yourself, that divinity in yourself and in everything you see around yourself. Ultimately, that's what alchemy is. It's finding that perfect balance of alignment between man and divinity. Okay. That's, well, right. what, what is, uh, so I guess, where so does now, Braille, where does Braille come so from? You were just going to say that. <laughs> I was going to go right into it. Sorry. So now again, well, Braille itself, as we know, is a tool, a tactile system that was created to help guide people who lack the sense of sight, navigate through a world which they can't perceive. And that's B-R-A-I-L-L-E. Right. Now, Braille, B-R-A-Y-L, like I use it, is a tactical system that is created to help guide your vision and strengthen your dream, your feel for dreams. It basically goes back to the concept of I once was blind, but now I see. Mm -hmm. And so the concept of this book rests in that idea of Braille, I once was blind, but now I see. It's a tool to help 
guide your vision and strengthen your feel for dreams. And so that's where Braille comes in. It is this elixir of dreams. It's this modern recreation of alchemy tailored specifically for dreamers, for you and your process in achieving whatever dream it is that you're after or whatever makes you tick or that that person that steps off that that beaten path and realizes that there is more to what we have been told and easily sold and goes about trying to better themselves in order to achieve this ultimate end that they're after because ultimately it's 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 you it's yourself that you are achieving you're not achieving anything it's you you are creating yourself into this ideal image of the person who deserves the life that you feel like you deserve. And ultimately, and that's what Braille is about, and that's what the concept is with Braille and how it parallels to the actual Braille itself. Mm-hmm. Now, the Braille stone itself, what I created is a brand new philosopher's stone. Now, within alchemy, you've always had this you have two you have two main tools in alchemy right you have this elixir of life which is this magical substance that's known to give life this elixir of life is basically that same substance that we talked about that same animating source we talked about in flesh Mm -hmm. that one animating source that's responsible for everything that you see that's behind everything you see and that's what this elixir it is speaking to it's speaking to that this magical source that gives life that no one can quite put a finger on and so you have these two parts of alchemy, the elixir of life, and then you have the philosopher's stone. The philosopher's stone is this tool that's designed to help aid your process, your transformation to a better side of yourself, to a more heightened awareness. And so what I, and now the philosopher's stone is, is, a, is a common term that's tossed around a lot. You can even find it in Harry Potter. It's, yep. it's, oh, yeah, of course, it's, it's, that's the more readily used version of it but it's just this 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 tool that's designed to help you in your process of growth basically and so i was able to create um what i consider a modern philosopher's stone derived from the mythical element of this philosopher's stone and what it's supposed to do and what that is is this braille stone which i created which is basically it's a exclamation mark and a backwards and upside down question mark right now, in life, we tend to always ask straightforward questions, and we think it's pretty simple and we should get a straightforward answer. But in reality, we never do, right? Society doesn't readily give us answers that we need or answers that we, we are to questions that we're really asking, you know? It's that, that, that search or that endless pursuit of some sense of truth, right? I mean, there's so much that I feel like I was lied to about growing up. Yeah. And I'm sure we can all <laughs> agree on that. Yeah. It's like, wait, this is not what I was told. This is not how I was told it was going to be. But I feel like I've been lied to so much by society in my life that I've come to realize that, wait, I've been asking all these straightforward questions and getting all these backward answers. I think it only makes sense to ask backward questions and maybe I'll get some straightforward answers. Right, and it seems like you start to really come to your own when you start asking these these, these sense of questions that aren't necessarily the norm. Right, and so that's where the backwards and upside down question mark comes from, mixed in with the exclamation mark. And now, whenever you start asking these backward and upside down questions, I believe you are beginning to make the statement of your life. You're taking the steps necessary to make the statement of your life, and hence where the exclamation mark comes in. And so when you bring these two tools together, now you have you form this stylized Y, which uh, I guess you can see if you uh, look at the symbol or if you go on the website, the Brailstone.com, T-H-E-B-R-A-Y-L-S-T-O-N-E.com, the Brailstone.com, you'll see it, you see the symbol, and it's enigmatic. It, it, it pulls you in, but... It represents your need to take a stand for yourself in order to make the statement of your life. All right. Well, that I think I need to look into it more and and really take it all in because that's a lot. Yeah, it's it's a lot. It's uh, for sure. It's it's jam packed. It's really it's that's really interesting. Um, I want to. uh, Well, I'll say everybody check out the the website. I'm probably gonna look into that a little bit more. I, I kind of want to like ask for examples, but I don't want to. I don't want to get off too much, because uh, I think we're running a little bit long already. 
let me get back. Let me get down to the last couple of questions here. Yeah, sure. So I like to leave our listeners with a little bit of research to do. What are some inspirations for you? Who is somebody that like are people that are listening and look up? And I'll say, or and you can say, yeah, this is who I took my inspiration from. You know, actors, writers, uh, what have you. Who do you look to to uh, to kind of like guide your path? Two, three, four, however many you want. I love Dostoevsky. <laughs> I know he's just a giant, but yeah. uh, of literature. But man, yeah, he's the, great. <laughs> the depth of character that he that we're privy to with his work is just. It's so rich, man. I, I love his work. I learned a lot from his work. And I also love Marshall Mathers. <laughs> Eminem. Eminem. Slim Shady. Yeah. Oh, man. It, it, lyrically, I study it. Yeah. Lyrically, I absolutely study it. I think it's phenomenal what he's able to do with these words. That was, you know, <laughs> the same that was... words that we all have access to. He just puts them together yeah. in this way. It's just like, wait, what? That was high school for me, man. That was, you know, eighth grade high school. That was kind of my introduction to hip hop, rap, that type of stuff. I, I just, and you know, I'm a white kid from the suburbs, so like, <laughs> of course I was no Eminem. But uh, you know, that that kind of got me into some other some other stuff that is. I, I'm not I'm not big into pop music in general, whether it's hip hop or rock or whatever. But you know, listen to Eminem was kind of where where I got my start on down that path. Yeah, but like it's it's not even about. Me him being a white rapper or it's just about the pure skill set that he oh, has of course yeah and what he's, he's doing he's a monster <laughs> and it hasn't stopped since we were in eighth grade yeah. uh, you know and it's still it's better than ever now i mean now i listen to, to, to what he's saying and and how he's putting it together and it's phenomenal i mean as a writer you should literally sit down and go through eminem's lyrics and understand how he paints these pictures all the way he, he the double meanings behind everything and how he makes things rhyme that don't necessarily rhyme at all it's yeah it, it's he has mastered his craft and it, it's amazing to watch not everyone gets it but i know i'm going on and on about him and i'm like praising him like he's got right now <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's it's it's, it's, it's phenomenal what he does so long too it's it's really impressive yeah, if you take the time to sit down and study his, his lyrics, it's uh, there's so much to learn from it, yeah. from a writing perspective. That's really, I guess, what I what I love about it. All right. Well, anybody, any anybody else you want to mention? Inspirations. Yeah. Is that what we're still on? Yeah, inspirations, inspirations. or anybody you use for reference. I love the book The Alchemist. <laughs> that was phenomenal. There you go. That book actually made me cry, put a tear to my eye. That was <laughs> I've great. definitely been there before. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was awesome. I remember um, a neighbor of mine when I was living in L.A. is the one who introduced me to it. Uh And I was like, all right, let's see what this is about. (laughs) Sat down, read the thing, came back the next day. Oh, my God. (laughs) Read it all one day. That book. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, it's a a, a great piece of work. Also, Little Prince is phenomenal, too. I feel like The Alchemist is this Little Prince grown up. Mm Mm-hmm. That's a great book. I mean, a great children's book, but yeah. filled with so many lessons that everyone should go back to once in a while. Yeah, I mean, I can go on for Let's go on to the next question. All right, all right. Well, uh, well this is probably going to be the last one. Do you have anything new coming out? New films? Uh, <sighs> books? Well, I know the book. Well, the book is coming, definitely. And that's been like my labor of love for the past three years, three, four years. Yeah. Coming together and working that thing out. Movie-wise, yes. It was a pretty awesome film that we just finished recently. It's in the post-production phases right now. It's called The Cold Side of the Sun. Now, this story is so flipping awesome. <laughs> it's, it's about... Well, it's, it's an international film that's shot between here and Chile. It's about this young writer named Antu. And Antu is trying to finish this one masterpiece screen, script that he's been writing or trying to write, but he has this crazy psychological block that's just stopping him. Yeah, that sounds really. That sounds really cool. I'm. I'm definitely. Uh, I'm in for that one. Where, where is that? Do you have a premiere uh, date or anything? No, like not yet. It's um. It's in the process of actually trying to. We're trying to sell it. Yeah. So uh, awesome. yeah. Is it a, another short or is? is no, it it's a, a full length feature film. Feature length. Nice. Yeah. 
All right, well, I think that's pretty much it. I want to let people know that they can find you at catherside.com, and we'll put this in the liner notes so everybody can just click on a link. You can find your book at brailstone.com. Yep. Uh, anything else? You got Facebook, Twitter you want to plug? Uh, Facebook, catherside.com, and um, yeah, uh, Friday, Flesh will be premiering at the Golden Door International Film Festival happening in Jersey City. Nice. It's uh, held at the Lowe's paramount theater down there that's this friday coming up this friday coming up this at will not be PM. <laughs> oh, well, in, in the that past case, you could have gone yes, yeah. so yeah we've had the screening and it was awesome and everyone <laughs> yeah. came out it was and great pictures were flashing everywhere paparazzi were just eating me up yeah and it chewed me up and spit me out <laughs> and here i am <laughs> all the all the you know all the greatest actors of our time came out i'm sure yeah they all came out Morgan um, Freeman narrated the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, did you say that there was another, you had another screening? Yes, it, um, that? after that, on October 10th, the Atlantic City Sin Festivals. Atlantic City Sin Fest. That's where I, we can definitely get it out before that. So oh, that sounds we'll good. do that. <laughs> that. Is that a Friday, did you say? That is a Monday, I believe. It's a Monday? All right, we'll put this out the Friday before that. So. Oh, no, I'm mistaken. I think it's Columbus Day. Oh, wow. Well. Whatever that means. Columbus. <laughs> yeah. eh, Columbus. That's, a, that's a whole other can of worms. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to start talking about Columbus right at the end of this Columbus show. Day. <laughs> Let's give me another 45 minutes. All right, well, I guess that's it. Uh, anything else you want to talk about, plug, or anything before we this go? This is the most I've talked, like, ever. I don't, I'm not a talker, <laughs> so I'm all well talked out. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, talking talking yourself out for us. Uh, uh, I'm Steve Ormosi, or Steve-O. I've been here with Catherine Sai. Thanks again for coming on. Absolutely, man. Thank you for having me on. This was a very cool experience. You guys are pretty awesome. <laughs> and we'll see you guys all next time. This has been On the Horn with Steve-O. Editing by Stephen Ramosi. Music by Christopher Morgan. And I'll talk to you next time. <laughs>